Traditional Church of North Brookfield. Please stand as we start our morning together with worship. There's revival and spreading like a wildfire in my heart. Sunday morning, hallelujah, and it's lasting all week long. Can you hear it? Can you feel it? It's the rhythm of the gospel song. Oh, once you choose it, you can't lose it. There ain't nothing, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy.
God's people said, Amen. Amen. And I forgot to do something earlier, so I'm going to do it now. I think he's old enough to sing to, but yesterday was Bob Downey's birthday. You're old enough to sing to, right? Yeah. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Bob. Happy birthday to you. God's blessings. God's blessings to you. God's blessings to you. God's blessings, fellow Christian. God's blessings to you. Happy birthday, Bob. Our Father. Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of God. Please be seated. Good morning. It is not snowing. It is not predicting to snow. It is looking like spring out there. And it's not raining. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> just a few announcements this morning. Our SEDA service is on April 22nd at 6 p.m. There is a sign up out in the foyer. It is, it's a full-blown meal. So you uh, you really want to participate in this. We are reenacting on the Jewish Passover what a Passover is like from a Christian perspective. So, so please uh, sign up for that and come. Uh, join us for dinner every Sunday right through the hallway. If you're visiting, we have information cards. The back of it is also a prayer card. So if you have a prayer request that's uh, not urgent and doesn't need to be shared with the body, you can fill out a prayer request and put it in the offering uh, when that comes by later in the service. And if you would like to give us your contact information, you can do the same. Just put it in the offering plate when that comes by later on. We also have a prayer email address where you can send your requests to. You can do that even now, and it will be sent to the people in our church that, that pray. So if you have a very confidential prayer request and you only would like the deacons to be praying over that, then just in the subject line put uh, confidential, and we'll be sure that it'll only go out to the appropriate people. We have been adding, I just want to uh, reiterate, we have been adding monthly a verse of scripture and making that our prayer for the month. I, I really want us to be a collective mind, a collective body, regularly, all of us at different meetings and different times throughout the day, be praying this scripture verse. And the, the verse that we've chosen is uh, from Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. I'm just going to read this, but I've put it into a prayer that we'll read together in just a moment. So, uh, therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, uh, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. And so taken from that, uh, we have a prayer that we'll, that we'll pray, but before we do that, we'll take requests, and then this will be ushering us into our time of prayer. I know that uh, some things that we want to be praying for, certainly uh, Israel, the Middle East, and all that's going on there, we want to be praying over that. Uh, Heather's service will be on Saturday at 11 o'clock. We want to be praying over that. 
Uh, Cindy Green got a biopsy back on her lungs and it was not cancerous, but still needs to be treated. So it's a praise, but continue to be praying. Um, Milka had lost her mom recently and we want to be praying for her. And a friend of Bridget's has breast cancer surgery tomorrow, so we want to be praying for her. Other requests that are urgent and need to be shared, Liz? I have a praise. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome praise, thank you. Praise the good. Okay. Well, let's let's pray, and uh, I'll begin our prayer. We'll all begin our prayer with this prayer. And then I'll put the slide up after of the, the people that we're praying for that are part of our community but not able to attend right now. Let's pray together. Lord, may we both receive you and walk in you. May we be rooted and built up in you. And may we be fully established in our faith through your teaching. And may we be a people abounding with thanksgiving for all you have done. Lord, we lift up to you these requests that have been made. And, and we pray for all of what's going on in the world today. And in particularly, we pray over Israel, the Middle East, and all that's going on there. We pray, Lord, for Heather's service on Saturday, uh, that your comfort would be great, your presence would be strong. We continue to pray for Cindy. We praise you for uh, the first part of the report to not be cancerous, but what to do next. We pray over that, Lord. We pray for Milka as she grieves the loss of her mom. We continue to pray for Bob as well as he continues to grieve. And Lord, we pray for uh, Bridget's friend having uh, breast cancer surgery tomorrow. And we praise you, Lord, for these infants that uh, are home and will be coming home. We praise you for Harvey and for Darlene. Lord, as we move into the portion of our worship where we look to your word, may you speak to us this morning, challenge us, change us, transform us by the power of your spirit, for your glory and for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Who are you talking to? I think when we hear something uncomfortable, we raise that question. Well, who are you talking to? You're not talking, not, no, you couldn't be talking to me. Um, that's a question that Peter asks uh, in this section of scripture that we will be looking at today. We've looked at the preformal history of Christ We've looked at his Galilean ministry, and he is now on the road to Jerusalem, to the cross, and this is where we have been and will be for a while. And today we're looking at Christ's return and our readiness. Christ's return and our readiness. And previously, I just want to paint the picture of where we are because we're still in a narrative story, and we're still in the same story that we've been in for a number of weeks now, where the crowd is growing and pressing in, and there were two objections, rejections towards Christ's ministry, where, where they were acting in a negative way, and, and so the crowd had, by the power of the prince of demons, you're casting out demons. We saw that, and we talked about that. And they also were looking for a sign. And last week, we, we looked at the eye as being the lamp of the body and the evil eye stares that we uh, often have that perhaps we shouldn't. And Jesus talking to the Pharisees, remember, ratcheting up the tension, calling the Pharisees out for their bad behavior, for their hypocriticalness and he says woe to you and there were six different 
woes that we looked at. And so this crowd is still here and they're in the thick of this crowd and and Jesus had dinner with a Pharisee last week and he leaves after all of the woes and, and the tension is so thick, so great. And that brings us to where we are now in chapter 12. And we are gonna actually tackle an entire large chapter today. So Ron is bagging up stuff for lunch to... (laughs) What's that? You could be, you could be. So this is all of what we're looking at today, all of chapter 12. And, and chapter 12 is made up of different sections, but they are held together. And, and so we really, if we separated them out and went through them in detail, it would be very hard to get the connectedness to it. So there are connecting words that connect the different sections together. We, we can see the crowds and you can see the places where the word crowds is tying things together. We, we can see the word anxious or uh, worry being there and connecting sections together. We can see birds being talked about and connecting together. The son of man, the term son of man that Jesus uses of himself, connecting sections together. The hypocrites, it's the bookend. It begins, he starts today talking about hypocrites and, and he's going to end talking about hypocrites. Uh, I tell you, it's mentioned one, two, three, four, five different times Jesus is connecting things by saying, I tell tell you. And treasure, the idea of a treasure is connecting different sections. And and there are two connecting pieces about barns in different contexts. And the idea of life is connecting. And so this entire chapter is very strategically by Luke woven together and connected. When, When I grew up in the Catholic Church, there was a place in the Mass just before communion, and it's still done today, where the priest will say, let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Now, in biblical, in biblical uh, terminology, very often a mystery is not something unsolved, but something that was hidden that has now been made known. And so growing up, the priest would say, let us proclaim the mystery of faith. And, and everyone would sing, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. And so Christ will come again. That is something that is so woven into the fabric of the Christian faith that Christ will come again. Amen? Amen. So Christ will come again. That is, a, that is a foundational thing in our faith. And, and we think of it often, or we should think of it often. Christ will come again. We, we certainly think of it when, when we are paying respects in a funeral service to somebody. It is our hope that we stand on that Christ will come come again. But we're missing something that is pointed out so poignantly in this chapter today. Yes, Christ will come again. And that is a grounding, foundational thing of our faith. But I think what gets neglected, what we don't think about, is where we will be at that moment. Where will we be? Not just geographically, where will we be? Where will you be spiritually? Where will you be in your faith? Where will you be in your actions? Where will you be? Because what this chapter talks about, what we will be looking at is different pictures that Jesus paints and creates of different scenarios of where you might be when he returns. Some of them are places where you want to be. 
some of the pictures that Jesus paints is where no one wants to be. So the message this morning, if you, if you, if you fail to take anything away with you, where will you be when he returns? What will you be doing? That is a question we should be pondering deeply. And, and, and that's what happens here. And, and this whole chapter 12 is very interesting because the audience who is hearing what Jesus is teaching, the audience that is here, is made up of the apostles, the disciples, and the crowd. And, and so the scripture tells us, right in the beginning, we'll see that there is a myriad of people. Typically means thousands, like a number in the thousands. There are thousands of people pressing in and gathering around Jesus. And of those people, some of them are the 12 apostles. Some of them are the disciples that we've been hearing about, the disciples that were sent out to proclaim and to come back, the disciples who were given authority to over demons and to heal and, and came back to report. And so the crowd, the, the people hearing, the audience is the, the apostles, the disciples, and the larger crowd. In, in a sense, we have that here among us today. So as we hear this message about the apostles, the disciples, and the crowd, think of, because I'm, I am not a proponent that we have modern day apostles, but we have leaders. The apostles were the leaders. And so today, in, in, right here in this sanctuary, we have people who are leaders. We have people who are part of the church, and we have others that are perhaps onlookers, curious, seeking, thinking about, but are, are not completely yet connected in. And so we have a, a representation of the, of the demographics that Jesus was talking to. We have people who are leaders in the church. We have people who are committed in the church. And we have people who are onlookers. We're, we're glad if you are an onlooker. We're glad that you're here. We celebrate that. It, and, and we hope and pray that you would move from the, from the place of spectating to participating. That's some of the language that I often use. So here's, again, all of this chapter 12. And what we see is very interesting because Jesus here in verses 1 through 12 is addressing the disciples, the apostles and the followers of Jesus, the disciples. And he's allowing the crowd to kind of eavesdrop in. And, and then we find in 13 to 21, Jesus is addressing the crowd. That doesn't mean he's not addressing the disciples, but he turns his focus to talking to the crowd. And then we find that he talks back again to the disciples. And then we find on verse 41, it gets uncomfortable. And as I said, Peter is... is going to say what everybody else is thinking. Whoa, hold on, hold on. Are you talking to us? Are you talking to me? And Jesus doesn't really answer the question. And he continues on and addresses what seems to be something pointed at both. So it flips back and forth. Disciples, the crowd. Disciples, the crowd. So let's, let's dig in and look at the disciples and this conversation that he's having while thousands of people are overlooking and, and, and part of the conversation, but not the focus. And, and what we find is that there are three warnings to begin with. We're going to go fairly fast as we go through some of this. There's, I believe is I have 196 slides today. Um, if, that, if that freaks you out, we're at 52, so they, 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 can, they can go fast. So, so Jesus begins talking to the disciples among the crowd 
and he hits on three different warnings. A, a warning that your deeds will be exposed. Already, there should be some uncomfortableness to that. There is a warning that you could be thrown into hell. There should be uncomfortableness about that. And there is a warning that if you do not acknowledge Christ, he will not acknowledge you. Do you see why Peter starts to get uncomfortable and, and brings it to the point where he says, wait a minute, wait, are, you, are you talking to us? But here's the thing, right here in this section, Jesus is talking to them. So let's look at deeds exposed. In the meantime, meanwhile, back at the ranch. So in the meantime, uh, all of this is going on. Jesus has left the, the Pharisee's house after totally uh, calling them out. The crowds are now growing and pressing in. In the meantime, when so many thousands of the people had gathered together, they were trampling one another. Uh, Luke is drawing this beautiful, chaotic picture, representation of the crowds. They're not, they're not just gathered and, and sitting on the lawn like we might if we were, you know, at Tanglewood going at a concert. They, they are pressing in on him. They are tripping over each other, uh, trampling one another. This is the crowd that Jesus begins to speak in. He begins to say to his disciples first. Now, the Greek, you could put the comma either uh, after disciples or after first. Uh, it doesn't change the meaning, but it, it could be saying he began to say to his disciples first, meaning he's talking to them first. Or it could be saying he began to say to his disciples first, beware of. It could be either. Perhaps we could make a case for both. I think we could. So he begins to say to his disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy, Jesus is saying, is a small infectant that will become a taking over event if you let it. Beware of the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Now, he's just left saying, woe to you Pharisees. And so the hypocrisy of the Pharisees is being called out. And, and then Jesus says, nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. I don't know. I mean, would you want, would you want everyone to just know your mind and your thoughts, even right now? And what Jesus is alluding to is that your thoughts and, and what you are thinking will be made known at this point when Christ returns. That's a little unnerving. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. Edgy. Sometimes, you know, sometimes we land on, on texts that are uncomfortable here when we're preaching through a book, and, and here we are today. This probably isn't the feel-good, let's just, you know, feel good about everything kind of sermon, perhaps. So, uh, deeds exposed. Now, the idea of being thrown into hell. Here's what Jesus says. I tell you, my friends, my friends, again, to the disciples, I tell you, do not fear those who kill the body. The Pharisees are plotting to destroy him. The, 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 their lives are somewhat in danger. As certainly harm could befall on them for following Jesus. And, and Jesus is saying, don't fear the ones who can just kill the body. 
There's nothing more they can do after they kill the body. And then in the center, but I will warn you of whom to fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. The word hell is, in Greek is Gehenna. Uh, it's a, a location south of Jerusalem. The Kidron Valley empties out into it. And in, in, the, in the older days of the, New Te- of the Old Testament, sacrifices of children were done in this place. They burnt their kids on an altar to a god in this place. King Josiah comes in and he uh, destroys the place, destroys these temples. And what ends up happening is they make this place where they had sacrificed so many kids to a false god, they make this place the burning dump of Jerusalem. They bring all their refuse. They bring out the things, that the trash, the rubbish, and they burn it. And there is a perpetual fire going. Nobody has to start the fire. They just have to bring their stuff out and put it on it. That was called Gehenna. Jesus is making a metaphorical statement that there is something like that when we pass, potentially. This is a serious, serious statement. I will tell you who to fear. Fear him who has not only can kill, but has the authority to cast into hell. Imagine how poignantly clear and scary a statement like this was. They all knew what Gehenna was, the the dump to the south of Jerusalem where everything was always continuously smoldering and burning. But Jesus doesn't leave it there. It's not just fire and brimstone. He's talking to the disciples. And and if you're like me, as I was pouring through this and, and going over it, I'm going... I'm not sure I like this. We could skip this. I could read it fast. But imagine after that statement, here's what Jesus says next. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Are not one of them, and not one of them is forgotten by God? Why, even the hairs of your head, as few as they may be, are all numbered. Fear not. You're more valuable than sparrows. So there is an interesting blend because Jesus goes from this side to this side like that. And, and I like this verse so much better we move on and there's the not acknowledging and here's what Jesus says there and I tell you everyone who acknowledges me before men the the word here for acknowledge means uh, to recognize with a commitment or recognize with a promise this is a marriage vow would be this kind of an acknowledgement here, that you are acknowledging something that has a committed promise connected to it. The Son of Man, so, and I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge with the promise, with the commitment before the angels of God. And so here we see uh, the, the, the Trinity in this chapter. We see the, the Father, the angels of God. We see Jesus and we'll see the Holy Spirit in just a moment. And so all three are present in this chapter. 
And, and so the good news is that if we acknowledge with a commitment and promise, he will acknowledge with a commitment and promise. The downside of it is, but the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. Back to scary. Okay, going fast, and boy, we could spend a long time here in what is known as the unpardonable sin. And, and so Jesus now steps in and he says, and everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. This is such a difficult chapter. Boy, I, we should have just read it fast. <laughs> so what is meant here? What is Jesus talking about? An unpardonable sin, a sin that cannot be forgiven. I, I think part of it, when we look at the Trinity, we, we see the Father elevating and, and, and honoring and praising the other two. We see the Son praising, elevating, honoring the others, and, and we see the Spirit doing the same. It's this beautiful dance of a relationship of edifying, building, praising uh, the others. And, and I, I can only think when I, when I read this, you know, I could say this, you know, uh, you can say anything you want about me, but man, if you, if you treat Annie with disrespect, it's, that is like an unforgivable, I don't know what I could do. The relationship is so strong. And remember, Jesus is just coming off being told, it is by the prince of demons that you cast out demons. And, and, and talking about the Spirit of God and, and putting the Spirit of God in league with Satan. And, and, and Jesus is here talking about this and he's saying, say something about me. I get it. I'm heading to the cross. You mess with the Spirit. You mess with me. And what the unpardonable sin is, and we don't have time to go into it as deep as I would like to, but the unpardonable sin, when we look at it here, when we look at it in Matthew, and we put it into the context and bring them together, the unpardonable sin is rejecting the indwelling of the Spirit of God. Rejecting the indwelling of the Spirit, that is unforgivable when you reject. Now, does that mean that you can't accept at any point? You can accept that Spirit. But should the bridegroom return, should you pass before, and all of this is going to be talked about, that's a problematic thing. Okay. And when... They bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities. The synagogues, rulers, and authorities means both the Jewish, you know, leadership and the, uh, the Roman leadership. When they bring you to the authorities, don't be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say for the Holy Spirit. And here we bring in the Holy Spirit again and how it's connected. The Holy Spirit that indwells you will defend you as you need to be. Uh, and that's what's being said. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Again, pointing to the unpardonable sin being a rejection of what the Spirit of God is doing and rejecting the Spirit of God from indwelling you. Okay, so now Jesus talks to the crowd, and we really need to move fast, so I will probably read fast. Now he's talking to the crowd, but somebody interrupts. He's talking to the disciples, and somebody interrupts, and Jesus responds with, a, with that in a parable, but the person who interrupts, here's what it is. So just imagine, you know, Jesus is talking about these serious things. It's getting somewhat uncomfortable. The crowd is listening in, and then somebody in the crowd came with an agenda. Somebody in the crowd came with something they wanted Jesus to fix. And so right away, someone in the crowd said, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. What? What has that got to do with any of this? 
But here this guy interrupts, you know, teach it, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. First of all, we've seen this once before. Uh, when, when Martha goes to Jesus and says, Jesus, tell my sister. It doesn't go well with Jesus when you go to him with a request that's really not a request, but a demand to fix the wrong that has happened to you. That's what, and Jesus doesn't pay any attention, we'll see, he doesn't pay any attention, he doesn't search for any facts, he doesn't look for any kind of resolution to this all, he just folds out and tells a parable. So, uh, let's just start. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who made me judge or arbitrator over you and, and your estate? And he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. He's reading into exactly what this person's intention is. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Imagine this guy. This guy is saying, hey, Jesus, tell my brother to divide things out. And he's saying that to the disciples that are around him that have left everything. They have left their possessions. They have left their family. They have left their homes. They have left everything. And here's the guy going, hey, Jesus, over here, over here. Would you mind just telling my brother to give me half? The sad part is, we've all gone to Jesus with that kind of a request. Okay. And so then he tells this parable and he says, the land of a rich man produced plentiful. The subject is the land. He's not saying this guy did something phenomenal with the land. He's telling a parable. And he said, the land of a rich man. This is the first of Luke's three rich man stories. Uh, the land of a rich man produced plentiful. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I'll store all of my grain and goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you prepared, whose will they be now? Imagine them saying this and looking at this person and looking at the Pharisees who, who are known to be coveting things and to be promoting themselves and elevating themselves. How many times did you see I in here? And he told this parable, what shall I do for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, is this person stuck on themselves? Oh, we would never be. But God said, I'm taking you out of the land right now. You're, you're done. I, I'm, your soul is being called. And then he says, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. And now this person is thinking, I should have just kept my mouth shut. So now, with that distraction, Jesus goes back now to focus on the disciples, and he says, do not worry, and seek the kingdom of God. And so what we find here, and he said to the disciples, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, they neither sow or reap, they have neither storehouses or barns connecting to the parable, uh, yet God feeds them. Of how much more value a second time, of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to your life? If then you're not able to do as a small thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies and how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his glory and splendor was arrayed like one of these. 
But if God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? Here's that comfort again being brought back. And do not seek uh, what you are not, and do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. I, I've memorized this in the NIV, so it, I'm tripping. For the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added or given to you. All right, so now Jesus talks about the master returning. And he gives three different pictures of the master's return. And one of them is the master returns, the thief breaks in, and then the master returns. In this case, and man, I'm looking at time. Wow. Yeah. This one is worth pursuing, and, and I think we need to do a part two to, to do this right. Um, just where you're, I'm at 100 out of 207, so um, there's a few on the end that I, I wasn't presenting. All right, Jesus talks about the master returning. And in this case, and he changes it around in each of the instances, in this case, the master that's returning is Jesus. The house servants are the disciples. And he is addressing the disciples in this conversation. So here's this first picture of these three. And Jesus says, again, comforting his disciples, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So all the anxiety of the warnings, and we take them. We, we must take them and, and hold them. But they, they, they fall apart with this statement. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourself with money bags that do not grow old, with treasure in heaven that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. So store up yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves don't break in and steal, Jesus is saying. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. And now he says this, stay dressed. Uh, this is a rule in campus ministry, stay dressed. Um, what he's saying here in the Greek is to gird your loins. That's the Greek text is saying, gird your loins. So it, it's a term for the, for, the, for the men that wore the robe. They would pick their robe up and tuck it into their belt so that they could run and not trip. And, and so it was a way of being ready for action, to gird your loins. So Jesus says, stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. And I think of the verse in Revelation in chapter 3, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and eat with him and he with me. And so Jesus is saying, be watchful, be ready, uh, keep your lamps burning. And when I knock, open the door. And then he does something here that would shock the audience and the crowd. When the master of the house comes home from the wedding banquet and knocks on the door, he's expecting the servants in the house to be ready, to be watchful, to, to have the lamps burning and to open the door when he knocks. And when he comes in, 
the unthinkable happens. What no respectful, you know, uh, house manager, owner of the house would ever even contemplate doing. And if this doesn't bring us comfort. So they knock on the door and the, 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 the master comes in. And here we see this. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I tell you, he will dress himself for service. The master of the house will come in and dress for service? When he comes, truly, truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have the servants recline at the table and he will serve them. Nowhere would this have been an expected statement. It's shocking today. It was unbelievable then. If he comes in the second watch or the third watch and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. I can only think that as the disciples heard this and as they Fast forward to that last supper when Jesus foreshadows the return from the bridegroom, the second coming, that, that he foreshadows that by what? Dressing as a servant, serving them and washing their feet as they recline at the table. That's the picture that is painted for when Christ returns. That's the picture we want. Next week we'll look at how to have that and how not to have the other pictures that I provided. Let's pray. Father, it, it's unimaginable that you could come from the wedding banquet, open the door, Take on the role of a servant. Have those around you recline at the table and be served. Help us to be aware of the warnings that you have given. To be careful of the hypocrisy among us. To take seriously the, the commitment of acknowledging you and following you. To, to follow you. Help us to picture the, the, the burning dump heap that we want to avoid. Help us, Lord. Help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Closing hymn is 43. Please stand if you're able. Uh, hymn 43, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Once again, our benediction will read this prayer for the month from, taken from Colossians 2, 6 and 7. Lord, may we both receive you and walk in you. May we be rooted and built up in you. And may we be fully established in our faith through your teaching. And may we be a people abounding with thanksgiving for all you have done. 
Lord, as we go forth, may we contemplate your return, but also where we will be and what we will be doing until we meet again. We praise you, Lord Jesus, and we give thanks to you. Amen.